name is Tyler. Uh, I serve as a ministry fellow here uh, with Harvard College Faith in Action. Uh, and I was a student in HCFA. So I'm, I'm pretty much old. I'm like the youngest person on staff, but still the, like just old. Uh, I've been around for like seven years now. So that's crazy. And shout out to all the freshman ladies for, show, for showing up tonight. You guys are real leaders for sure. Leading by example, I love it. Um, okay, so I'm Tyler, that's that. Uh, tonight we're gonna be talking about leadership uh, and power and the image of God. Uh, so uh, I would love for a couple of you, maybe three people to be leaders uh, and give me an example of one leadership quality uh, that was mentioned in your breakout groups. Okay, so now is the time to, to test your mettle. Who is really a leader up in this up in this up in the Zoom call? All right. Okay. Um, I guess uh, our our breakout room kind of talked a lot about humility and um, kind of being able to lead by example and also particip participate in you know whatever project or task that you're working on and stuff. Um, and we thought that was like definitely uh, a pretty important characteristic for a leader to have. Great, so leading by example, being a team player, love it. That's great. All right, another leader. Come on, be brave. Humility. Um, so my group and I, we, we talked extensively about, uh, we feel like a, a leader embodies amazing qualities, reason why they own the role of leader but it's also able to have an incredible balance and discernment of when, when to, when to really um, ex expose each characteristic. And also while the balance would contain like, um, would, he would just be humble, he, she would just be humble um, in exhibiting those qualities, not belittling anyone, not making anyone feel um, lesser than, but um, knowing that the role deserves respect um, in embodying humility. Yeah, that's great. Is it Nacy? Did I say that right? Or Nacy? Yeah, Nacy? Okay, great. So yeah, Nacy, that's awesome. So humility and humility actually kind of includes like not being a show off, but strategically deploying your talents, right? That's really good. I love that. All right, one more. Yeah, I think another one would be communication. I think it's always really important for good leaders to not only be really transparent and hum, hum what's the word? Humble, oh my goodness. <laughs> kind of like what Nacy just said, but to be able to have open conversations and get feedback with all of their team members. So yeah, I think I've always had really great experiences with good communicative leaders. Yeah, that's great, right? So a leader is somebody who has followers and sometimes people can't follow you if they have no idea like what the goals are or what you want them to do, et cetera, et cetera. So communication, super duper important. I think that's all great. All right, so what I'm gonna do now uh, is share my screen and we're gonna hop into an understanding um, uh, and that's exactly right, Cam. Thanks. Uh, so love, love is super important. Don's going to talk about more, talk about that more later. But what we're going to do is hop into a theology of leadership from a Christian perspective, like the sort of look at the unique Christian story of leadership and how to use power. All right, and look at it through the image of uh, the image of God, the lens of the image of God. Uh, and then Don's going to give a talk about uh, what are sort of three fruits that Christian leadership can offer us? Like, what are the ways in which Christian leadership can transform us? All right. So I am going to first uh, just share my screen here. Can you guys see this? It says list of Harvard University people, right? Okay. So I know some of the people here are not from Harvard. First of all, welcome Columbia. Uh, welcome any of the other CU ministries that are here with us tonight. Uh, I'm super excited to have you guys with us. Um, I went to Harvard, so I have a bit of Harvard pride. Uh, yay, Harvard. Um, but here's the fact of the matter. If you go to Harvard or if you go to any Ivy League school at all, you have power. And that's one thing that's super important to recognize. 
So Harvard actually has eight presidents of the United States that's, that have graduated from Harvard uh, and over 150 Nobel Prize winners. And then the rest of these people, I'm gonna just keep scrolling. The rest of these people were important enough that they had Wikipedia pages written about them, okay? So this, this is just a page of Harvard alum or people who worked at Harvard or people who went to Harvard. I'm still scrolling. I could be here scrolling all night, okay? So these are people who have used their power to impact the world in some way, okay? Uh, so it's just a fact of the matter that if you go to an Ivy League school, you are automatically in the class of people uh, that we would describe as a leader, okay? Um, Great, can you guys see the slideshow now? Great, so that's just to give you some sense of like why I think it's important to talk about leadership is because you guys will be leaders. It, it doesn't matter where you go next in life, you will be a leader and you are already a leader at Harvard. And many of you were leaders in your high schools and middle schools and this is why you're at Harvard already. I know some of you had ridiculous resumes. You like did an insane amount of stuff. You were a part of super future leaders of America and the globe, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever organizations, right? Future farmers, future bakers, whatever. Uh, so you have already practiced leadership um, and you have, you have wielded leadership and you have wielded power, okay? Um, by the way, that's just a swaggy picture of me. I'm just gonna show you guys the, uh, the outline of tonight. So we're gonna talk about why we must lead, right? Then we're gonna talk about uh, how we got power, how we lost our power, and how Christ restores our power. Um, and then we're gonna talk about how the story of Christ like helps us to lead, okay? So here's a guy, his name is Lord Acton. It's really funny because uh, one of our student, what, one of my classmates from Harvard, his name is uh, John Acton. And this guy's name is also John Acton. But this guy is way more important at this point than my friend John Acton. Uh, and that's because this guy said uh, this quote, maybe you've heard it before. He said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. And maybe some of you like resonate with that. You know, you're looking at uh, like politics in the United States right now, or maybe you're thinking about some coaches that you've had in the past or some teachers that you've had in the past, maybe your parents, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody who had authority over you who did not wield that authority well, and you were hurt by it right? Or people that you know were hurt by it. Um, I think there are some statistics that kind of articulate that kind of trust in the United States government and trust in institutions in the United States is kind of at an all-time low right now. And so people have a distrust of power. That there, there's this idea that power kind of leads to corruption, that power always somehow produces a bad outcome. Here's what's true. Again, as an Ivy League student, you bear power. But if the gospel is true, this is what I want you to understand tonight. If the gospel is true, we have to inhabit a different story. Lord Acton cannot be correct about power if the gospel is true. And we're going to talk about the reasons why that's the case tonight. So here's the first thing. Uh, is that the story of Genesis 1 and 2 argues that God is good and that God is omnipotent. And therefore, because God gives power, power can be good, okay? So God is good, God has power, God gives power, so power can be good, all right? And uh, one of the words that the scripture uses to describe power in these first, uh, these first chapters of the Bible is this word dominion, okay? Um, in Genesis 1, the scripture says uh, that God made all of the things that exist in the world. He made the birds and the plants and the sun and the moon and the stars uh, and, and everything that there is that exists. And then in 126, there's a shift in the story and God creates something that is different than everything else that he creates. Uh, he says, we will make this thing in our image and likeness. And so if somebody wants to be a leader and call out what it is that God makes in his image and likeness, go ahead and do that. Man and woman 
Yes, that's right, Macy. That's exactly right. Human beings are different than anything else that God creates, right? Um, and so God makes human beings in his image and likeness. Those two words are really important. And along with the image and likeness of God comes dominion. That is, God is a ruler. And if we're made in God's image, then we also are called to be rulers, okay? So power is actually a part of what it means to bear the image of God, to have dominion. And we know this because in Genesis 1, the scripture says, and God blessed the man and the woman after he created them. And it says, and God said, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the birds uh, and the, the plants and everything else that I've created. And then the last uh, words of, uh, of, of Genesis chapter uh, one is, uh, and, God said, and God saw that it was very good. So, so God giving human beings power is a good thing, according to God, according to scripture. All right, so here are some of the words that are used to describe human beings' dominion. Humans are meant to be fruitful and multiply, which of course means reproduction, but it also means that human beings are called to uh, create life right? We're, we're called to use our power to produce flourishing in the world, not to produce oppression or to produce uh, uh, inequality, but instead to produce abundance, just like God uses his power to create life, okay? So in creation, human beings have the ability to either uh, use their power towards destruction or use their power towards creating life like God, and that's what we're called to. We're called to work and keep the garden. So God has given us raw materials, like this garden that's in front of them. And God says here, like work and keep this garden, right? And actually something that I think is really cool is that God tells Adam to name the animals, right? So God doesn't actually tell Adam what all of the names of the animals ought to be. He actually gives Adam the authority to name the animals himself. So this is where creativity comes from, right? Like God actually... Uh, sets the universe into motion and he creates things uh, out of the sort of ingenuity of his mind. And then God empowers human beings to be just as creative, <clears throat> to sort of take the raw materials of the universe and to be creative with them and to name things which have not previous, previously been named. <clears throat> so these are just a couple images of what creational leadership looks like. It looks like being fruitful and multiplying, and it looks like working and keeping in the garden and being creative. All right. <clears throat> now, here's where the story goes a little bit awry. Um, this is a, a, a sort of painting of the Garden of Eden. Everything looks really beautiful here. There's something interesting um, in the book of Exodus, there's another reference to likenesses, except there's a negative command uh, associated with likenesses. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, does anybody know what we're not supposed to do with likenesses? Go ahead and just call okay. it out. Yes, that's exactly right. Is that Caleb? Thank you. Yeah, great, Caleb. So human beings are not meant to make likenesses. And this is why, okay? So... <clears throat> There is a likeness that exists, right? That's meant to be worshiped um, or, or that's meant to sort of practice worship, right? So human beings are made in the likeness of God and God gives his likenesses authority, okay? And so God says, do not make new likenesses because I gave you authority, right? God says, I gave humans authority. Don't make up new authorities to worship. All right, so that's the, that is the, uh, that's the sort of call that God gives to us, right, uh, is to worship him and him alone, right, and then to reflect his image outwards, and then do not make new images, like do not make new likenesses, because if you do, you will be really tempted to worship those things, okay, so um, that's called idolatry, if you didn't know, when human beings make a thing, and then worship the made thing rather than worshiping the creator. When we worship a created thing rather than our creator, that's called idolatry. And it's really bad. Everything negative in the Bible, every sin is somehow tied to idolatry, okay? Um, 
And so here's the interesting thing, though, is that any good thing that God has created is actually uh, a threat for idolatry, like a candidate for idolatry. And we see that nowhere better than in the story of Adam and Eve. So if you look at this painting, it's kind of interesting because this tree that Eve is touching, it doesn't look that different from the rest of the trees that are in the garden, right? Um, and so it looks like a good tree, right? But what we understand from the story of Genesis chapter three is that there is a serpent, right? And this, it says that the serpent is more cunning than any other being that existed. Uh, and the serpent says, did God say you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve says, no, he just told us not to eat from this one tree in the garden, uh, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then the serpent replies to Eve, God knows, uh, uh, God knows that you will not surely die if you eat from that tree. But instead, what will happen if you eat from the tree is that you will become powerful, right? Like you will be like God, right? And so this is where power gets human beings into trouble, right? So human beings turn away from the, the, their creator. They turn away from the one who gave them their power in the first place. And human beings look at power as something to worship, something to disobey God for, right? Something to worship instead of God. And so they reach up and they grasp for power, right? They don't reach up and grasp for God. Instead, they reach up and they grasp for power, which is exactly what's happening in this image right here. Eve is reaching up and grasping for power, okay? And so here's the interesting thing is that uh, Satan, uh, the serpent, is encouraging Eve to turn away from God as her source of power and instead turn to a created thing as a source of power. And that's exactly idolatry, right? But the interesting thing is that that's actually how idols gain authority over us. Idols actually have no power, no power at all, like an apple has no power or like a fruit in this garden. It has no power except for that power which we are deceived in, into surrendering to them, okay? So this is what the scripture says about the, the, the fruit. It says that it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, that it was desirable to make one wise, right? Desirable to make one wise, that there was, there was power that was sort of like that Eve was drawn to, right? But if she had said, no, I'm not going to eat the fruit, like, you know, we'd be chilling in the garden still, right? Uh, but instead, Eve surrenders her righteous authority to this inanimate object, right? Or even she surrenders her, her authority to the serpent. She says, yeah, I'll obey the serpent instead of obeying God, right? And so she gives her authority to someone that she is, in fact, meant to have dominion over. And so the, the creation order gets turned upside down. And that's where, where really wicked stuff kind of comes in. And we can do this, you know, with anything, not just serpents or fruit, but we can, we can choose to worship vain internships or cushy jobs or political power or status or money or attention or affirmation or sex. Anything that's created, we can choose to worship and, and choose to worship a created thing rather than our creator. And when we choose to do so, the result is that we will surely die, like the scripture says. Because what we do is we actually, we, we separate ourselves from our source of life, right? God is the source of life and human beings worship God. And then when we turn to some created thing, we actually choose to worship something and tie ourselves to something which is not eternal. So it necessarily produces death and destruction in our lives, okay? And so this is how sin, this is how sin uh, sort of spreads throughout the world, is that human beings choose over and over and over to turn away from their creator and turn to some created thing as the source of their power. But the power in the created thing is not uh, eternal. It's finite. And so, and so we'll lose in that situation. Like we will, we will lose our lives and instead tie ourselves to something which will end, which will necessarily end our lives, okay? So that's the, the cost of idolatry. And so, yeah, we come back to Lord Acton and like power tends to corrupt. Like will, will power actually tend to corrupt? Uh, 
that's what it seems like at the end of uh, Genesis chapter, uh, at the end of Genesis chapter three. But then we have the whole rest of the Bible to figure out, uh, you know, if that story is true. And so I say, uh, let's look quickly at the, the person of Jesus, right? Jesus is actually our liberating leader. And so I love this painting a lot because Jesus is first of all crowned up here and he's crowned with the cross. And so that's gonna be important to talk about. But also uh, this is sort of a painting of this scripture. It says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, right? So Jesus is up here, like a part of the, the creative mechanism that sets the universe into place. And then down here you have humans, right? But it's weird to see that Jesus is somehow setting things into motion and creating things, um, especially because, well, the crucifixion happens after creation, right? I think what this painting is trying to communicate is that Jesus is the Lord over a new creation. And so we're going to talk about what leadership looks like in that new creation, all right? So this is how Jesus succeeds in leadership where we fail, okay? And in doing so, liberates us to be the leaders that we were always called to be. This is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, this is super interesting, right? Because Eve grasps in the garden, right, the desire to be like God, right? And Jesus does the opposite. He doesn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, right? But what does he do instead of grasping for power? It says he emptied himself by being taking uh, the form of a servant by being born in the likeness of men, right? So Jesus becomes a man to do what man up until, up until his life was unable to do, which is fulfill God's original call to have dominion and to, to have dominion in the image of God. And so the scripture says in verse eight, being found in human form, this is what it looks like to bear the image of God in your leadership. It says, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what Christian leadership looks like fundamentally is obedience to God, right? Tying yourself to the eternal source of power rather than some finite source of power. And when Jesus does that, when he humbles himself to that extent, right? When he doesn't grasp for power, but instead grasps for service and obedience to God, this is what happens. It's really counterintuitive. It says, therefore, God has highly exalted him. Therefore, because he humbled himself, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. I'm sorry, somebody say amen. That's, that's fire, isn't it? Right? So because Jesus doesn't grasp for power, precisely because he doesn't grasp for power. God looks at him and says, yes, that guy is qualified to be Lord over all, right? God says, yes, you are gonna practice leadership in the way I created you to. Here's all authority in heaven and on earth, right? And so that's, that's what leadership looks like in the mold of Jesus, okay? And so we look at the crucifixion, we look at Jesus uh, choosing to give himself to God, right? Choosing to sacrifice even his body and his life to God. And uh, in doing so, Jesus actually kind of submits himself to all of the false idols, all of the false authorities that exist in the world. I'm talking about like Pontius Pilate, the Sanhedrin, um, death itself even, right? Because idols, one of the ways that idols try to deceive us and, and uh, keep us trapped in their authority is that they threaten us with death, right? So we feel like, oh, if I don't get a Bain internship or if I don't get a cushy job or uh, if I don't uh, have sex, I'm not going to live my fullest life, right? I'm going to experience a kind of death. If I don't get a certain kind of job, I'm going to be missing out on life, right? Which is death in a way, right? Um, and so idols are always threatening us with death and we're afraid of death, right? 
But this is what Jesus is able to do to free us from slavery to sin and slavery to idolatry. The resurrection exposes that there is a power greater than the power of every idol. So if idols have the power to produce death, right? The resurrection proves that there is a power that can overcome the power of every idol. And God is that power because he is the one who has power over life and death, right? So God can allow somebody to be punished with death by an idol and bring them back to life because the idol is not more powerful than God, right? So Jesus rejects the idolatry of power. He's not deceived by power, but instead he exposes false powers. And because he's able to do that, he's crowned with divine authority. And when we follow Jesus, we learn to see like Jesus does, and we can see false authorities for what they are, right? We can see false powers for what they are and tie ourselves to the one true authority. And that's called being in Christ, okay? That's called being in Christ when we tie ourselves to the one true authority. And because Jesus has a crown on his head and we are in Christ, that means we also have crowns on our heads too. And so this is how you can access your divine leadership. Number one, you need to turn away from false authorities, right? Turn away from things that you think will give you power. Uh, and so you consider them more important than your relationship with God. So turn away from those sins, turn away from those false authorities. Number two, surrender to true authority in Christ, right? Start a relationship with Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to help me to see like you see, and I want to obey your authority. And then thirdly, this is my most, this is the thing I find most exciting is that you get to discover the dominion that you were called to at the beginning. You get to discover what is your area to be in charge of, or even areas, because, you know, some of y'all have lots of different interests. Okay, and then this is the last thing I'll say, uh, is that this is what our new authority looks like. Um, some of the kind of phrases that the scripture uses in the New Testament to describe what our, what our new authority looks like, the kind of scale of it, the weight of it, the glory of it, is one, we're gonna judge angels. <laughs> what? Right, that sounds crazy. If you wanna learn more about that, you can check out uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, verses, uh, first Corinthians chapter six, verses one through three. So somehow we're going to judge angels. It's not super clear what that means, but it is the weight of Christian leadership. Somehow in the afterlife, we are going to be responsible for judging angels. Secondly, we're going to be responsible for judging the world, right? All of the people who led people astray from the one true power, we somehow are going to be empowered by God to participate in the judgment of those people to determine, oh yeah, this person belongs with Jesus, this person does not. That's mind blowing and crazy. And then here's the third one, uh, crushing the head of the serpent. This is like a, <clears throat> a little line at the end of Romans that if you pay attention to it, it's kind of nuts. Uh, Paul says, the God of peace will crush the head of the serpent under your feet. And when he says your feet, he's talking about the church. He's talking about the people of God, right? So it's not that Jesus alone is going to be the one who defeats Satan. But instead, everybody who is in Christ, that means you and you and you and you and you, God is going to crush the serpent under your feet. That's what your leadership is going to accomplish in the world. That like all of Satan's evil and all of the ways that he controls people and has authority over people and wreaks havoc in our world, you are going to have a part to play in ridding the world of the authority of Satan and redeeming the world to what God created it to be. And that's, that's not a thing that God wants to keep for himself or that Jesus wants to keep for himself, but rather he wants you to participate in that work. That's kind of nuts, right? And so here's the last thing I'll say before I pass it to Don is that the entire structure of HCFA, and I would also argue the entire structure of the ministry at Columbia and uh, any of the other uh, CU ministries that you might be a part of, Christian Union Ministries, the entire structure of our campus ministry is designed to empower all of you to pursue your God-given areas of leadership and dominion, both here at Harvard and beyond. So that includes Bible courses, DOXA, discipleship groups, one-on-ones, ministry teams, retreats, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested, 
in accessing the divine leadership that God's called you to, this might be a place that you can learn how to do that. All right. Now we're going to talk about the three fruits or three fruits of Christian leadership or leadership in Christ. And I'm going to pass it to Don to, to kind of share with you guys about that. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks so much, Tyler. Um, uh, foundational, um, theologically rich uh, material. Um, our aim tonight was to just push open the door uh, into a, a building with uh, endless rooms. And uh, this is such a vast topic, but um, I was really encouraged to hear thus far um, in you know, sharing leader attributes, examples uh, already that you all seem actually rather conversant in this topic. Um, I get to uh, illustrate and to um, look at some application, but uh, I know that some of you anyway have given this a lot of thought uh, and it shows actually in the leadership that I see on display. Um, it, it might also be right that as humans, we almost intuitively can recognize good leadership and bad leadership. I think we're, we're really, most human beings are rather natural, naturally oriented to, you know, kind of rendering judgments and having some accuracy. And so anyway, <laughs> my hope in, in a few minutes is to uh, open up a biblical story one that you might be familiar with uh, from uh, even recently studying the Gospel of Mark. Uh, but uh, before, it's in actually Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to share my screen so you don't need to turn there. But it involves two of the uh, three inner circle disciples of Jesus that were not named Peter. Um, and that would be uh, James and John. Uh, they were brothers. Uh, and they are rather famous in the New Testament. Uh, we are very, very familiar with their, uh, their lives after Jesus and, and those outcomes, and we're going to even look at that briefly here as we look at their example. Now, James and John were given a nickname by Jesus. Does anyone happen to know what that nickname was? Oh, and there geez. Yes, wow. Uh, Sons of Thunder. And uh, no explanation is given as to why Jesus uh, gave them that nickname. Now, we can't know this for sure, right? But I'm confident <laughs> that the naming was not connected to uh, gastrointestinal disorder. I doubt that this was a genetic thing. Though, if it was, that would support my contention that Jesus possessed a, a, a pretty fantastic sense of humor. Uh, but so probably not related to that, the Sons of Thunder. Uh, but I do think there's enough evidence uh, to suggest that the Sons of Thunder had fiery personalities and uh, perspectives. And when it came to being Jesus' disciples, they were, they were pretty, pretty pumped about that and uh, maybe a little aggressive. I'll, I'll share just briefly a quick examples before we look at the, the passage. Um, I, I mentioned this maybe in a previous talk, but uh, when Jesus and friends were snubbed by the Samaritan village when they needed accommodations for the night, James and John were indignant. And do you know, does anyone remember what they asked Jesus? Permission? Jesus, do we have permission to uh, call down fire on the, the village to destroy it? That was their, their, their prayer request was um, in, 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 you know, kind of a, a righteous indignation was, should we smote uh, these people? They've uh, rejected us for the night. Jesus, of course, said no. And, uh, and kind of shut that down. But uh, one example, another example um, is I, I suspect that the disciples were, uh, were kind of buoyed along and, and we know that they were encouraged by the ministry that they had been able to participate in and what had happened in that ministry. I, I love the stories in the gospels. I repeat that, I bring them up too often. I think it's so meaningful when it comes to what uh, uh, Tyler was just describing and this mandate that we have, this the, the privilege that we have, but also kind of by design what we were called 
to do and to be and, and to you know, our work right on this earth. But they were commissioned early on to go out two by two without Jesus and do everything that he was doing and modeling for them, which to me is still, it blows my mind. They went out, fishermen, uh, tax collectors, uh, not a ton of training probably at that time, and they went, and it says that they had authority, power, right, over demons, and that's what they were most kind of jacked about is they came back and reported back to Jesus, and, and Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky, right, as in, in the kind of the spiritual realm, Jesus could see what was happening on the ground through his disciples, uh, so that's that's heady stuff, and I have no doubt the disciples were probably sent out a number of times. So they've got some experience under their belt. There's also this realization that Jesus is the Messiah, and they're like, "Oh my goodness, Jesus!" And, and Jesus had all this this powerful ministry, and they're like, "We are connected. We are close to. We are friends with. We've been called by this <laughs> the Messiah." You know, this was sinking in slowly. This was sinking in, and they were so excited. But here's what's fascinating about this. This is the same time as it's sinking in finally in the disciples' heads that Jesus was saying, I'm going to die soon. Um, I, I'm going to leave you soon. And, and they almost couldn't hear it because they were so enthralled with the idea of, of reigning with Jesus, right, in this kingdom that Jesus said was coming and that was here. And, and so uh, so little backdrop on, on the brothers. Uh, they were aggressive men. And then their mom chipped in. Uh, so let me share uh, my screen here uh, and give me just a moment. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, all right. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him, Jesus, with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, which by the way, were the, the most position, there's no greater, you know, kind of second row, second tier power, right? Right, left of the ruler. Um, they were jockeying for those two positions. Um, you don't know what you're asking. We are able. Um, it is not mine to grant this, but is for those to whom it has been prepared for my father. Request. Jesus doesn't, I don't think that was a strong rebuke, but there was a mild rebuke there. And when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, <clears throat> but whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So, so this is a, a, a power grab, right, by the disciples. Maybe their mom was instigating this, influencing them, but but it was. Uh, but you know, it's ironic about this, and and what Jesus really was almost pro was was prophesying there is, are you willing? Are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And of course, that cup referred to a cup of suffering, and that cup, that cup of suffering was exactly what uh, took James out. He was the first apostle to be martyred. Um, and we see that in Acts 12. Um, he was uh, uh, killed by the sword. And, and that was the first really kind of intense going after the leaders, the, the early leaders in the church. That was the first, you know, kind of blow. And, and, and the, the church scattered. They arrested Peter as well. And, and it looked like Peter might lose his life. So inner circle three disciple killed early. Um, and and I'm I'm when I look at mom in this scenario, I don't I certainly don't judge her. Um, she was you know kind of advocating for her sons, but that mother at least short term had her heart broken um, shortly after this, 
uh, the stakes are high, right? In in this, there there are power struggles on the earth, and the stakes are high, and it's not a game, and uh, you know that was certainly played out in the the early church, and so the question I want to ask, I want to just make this application. I'll, I'll just try to keep this moving. Um, one is to the, I still regularly ask myself this: Why do I want to? If you aspire to lead. And again, we all have we all lead and influence in different ways. But if you aspire to lead, and if your your sights are high, and you're like, I would like to do great things for God, the question to constantly ask ourselves is why? Why do you want to do great things for God? And that simple question, with the help of the Holy Spirit, will will reveal our motives. And here's what we're going to see. I pre- I, I this is not this is not prophecy. This is just reality because I, I know myself so well and I've known humans for a very long time. We are going to see some poor motives in there. Many, many times we're going to see, and sometimes old motives are going to be creeping up and they're, they're going to kind of like weeds start to, to, to come right back. We thought we put them to death, but we're told in the, in the scriptures to put these fleshly impulses to death, maybe if necessarily on a daily basis. And here's where we, we want to wield the power that we've been given in Jesus, first and foremost, perhaps, is to use that power to put to death the, the fleshly impulses and selfish ambition that will rise up in our heart and threaten our, the very leadership and the track, the, the, the destiny that God has for us. So, so use that power. God's power, his grace. No temptation to seize us, but that's common to man. The Lord is faithful. He won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able. Wield that power to put to death those those fleshly um, impulses. So that's first stop. Um, And and a quick note here. um, God is not looking for all stars. God is looking for faithful children working together to serve him. And we're going to look at that next. Uh, a, A little, a quick pro tip. Um, if God calls you to vocational ministry, please never, ever name a ministry after yourself. You know, please uh, keep the, the, the focus on Jesus everywhere you possibly can, because there is never a moment in this lifetime when I will not be vulnerable to the sin, of, uh, kind of fall into the sin of, of, of hubris and, and to, to be, become an arrogant person. That is possible for me still. I still battle it. You know, it, it still wants to rise up and, and kind of take over. Um, let me also say as well that, um, that, that uh, segue, localized leadership in, a, in any faith context is unhelpful. Uh, all power resting in a single person, I, I found to be unhelpful. And I think it's unbiblical. And I think that God, certainly wise, anticipating all of this, arranged things. We're going to look really briefly at, at what we can see in the New Testament. It's not a ton of evidence, but it's a little scant, but it, there's enough evidence to suggest that this is true. Um, so grace to be a team player, a second application point. Uh, we just looked at that powerful passage, um, serve like Jesus. We'll also look at other characters through Jesus and the way that he led in a, a future Doxa talk. But Jesus sent out empowered not just the 12, the superstars, right? The all-stars. The, the, no, he sent out 70. That's the, 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 actually, that's the example that, that blows my mind. He sent out 70. Those were some, there's some unqualified people in that 70, I'm sorry, that had gathered around and were following Jesus, unqualified just like me. That, and he sent them out endowed them with the same authority. And what does that say, right? What a great question. What does that say? Barnabas and Paul also commissioned elders for every church, plural. It was not an elder, a point person, you know, a king so-and-so to, to rule. It was elders. It was plural. It was, and, and that's for, uh, right, really, really good reasons. That's because elders, plural, provide uh, accountability for one another. They, they, checks, right? Checks and balances, but they also complement one another because they're gifted differently. And so you've got some elders that are that are just good up in, in giving leadership up front. Others that are are endowed with an ability to shepherd like all day long. Others who who are just so wise, they've been given the gift of wisdom. And and so when 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 it's like the rubber meets the road, it's like we need to make a decision. All eyes in the room turn to the elder that's endowed with wisdom, right? Perhaps it's the beauty 
of the body of Christ when operating in a healthy way. Uh, Peter referred to the priesthood of all believers, said that we all have direct access to God. We've all been endowed by the Holy Spirit, right? So that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into light. We are all given the responsibility and the privilege, right, to, to share the gospel wherever we are. The, the, the leaders in a church are also, by definition, to tend to prayer and to the word of God, and they were to equip the saints for ministry. And so here's, here's, the, here's the caution, right? It, the most natural thing to wor- in the world in our local churches, when you have paid professionals, right, that it, w- seminary went to, tra- you know, trained, whatever, is to look to those trained professionals for just about everything. They're the ministers, right? Uh, Got to have the minister come to the hospital because so and so sick, right? I mean, that's that. It's a very natural kind of uh, of thing that that happens, at least in our churches, at least in this country, at least in my experience. And we need to resist that and say, no, the ministers are the body. Everyone's a minister. There are some that are called to give some leadership. Thank the Lord. God bless them. They have more responsibility. They've been willing to take that. They're gonna. They need to serve the congregation. Give them a towel when we uh, ordain them and, and commission them as a symbol of service, and they are to equip the saints for ministry. <clears throat> and then Paul's, I love this. Um, I think Cam referenced. Uh, guess what? Sandwich uh, the sandwich here. A uh, twelve and fourteen are about spiritual gifts. If you're not familiar with them, please read this little chunk of, of scriptures from Paul uh, that, that define spiritual gifts, their function, uh, the, the checks, right. Uh, elevate those that are less, uh, you know, kind of hidden and less desirable so that there is not jealousies and, and, and all of that. It's, it's a beautiful chapter. I love chapter 12. Guess what the, the sandwich is? 13 is love is more, most important. It's the most important thing. And that's our, our last stop. We, w- we need to pray as leaders. Um, the first prayer I, I would suggest and, and posit would be that we pray not for wisdom. That's a good prayer. Not for uh, uh, you know, some ability that we feel might be lacking, whatever. Those prayers might come later. Here's the first prayer that I would beg you to pray. Pray that God would give us a heart to love people that we're serving and that we're leading, and that he would, he would burden us even with a love for the people that we're, that we're living with and right alongside, and, and, and that love would keep us from elevating ourselves in any way, shape, or form, and we would care for their souls, right? So, and, and here's the, I want to go back to John uh, and finish with this. Fiery John, right? Uh, a son of thunder. Um, call down, you know, fire on the Samaritans, those terrible people, um, is the, the disciple who later, and, and maybe quite a bit later, but later would write a gospel that, that we, are, we are so familiar with. It's my favorite of the four gospels. And you know how he identifies himself in the Gospel of John? He doesn't, other than to call himself the disciple that Jesus loved. That's how John identifies himself in the Gospel of John. He, he went from an understanding of, 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 you know, divide and conquer and, and rule and reign. This is exciting to Jesus more than anything else that he's done for me, loves me. The, the, the Lord that I've been learned to, to I've been following and, and learned about and, and, and I'm willing to give my life to now, first and foremost, loves me. If that's true for Jesus and John, then that's our blueprint, right, for us and any kind of leadership that we have. And I don't think it has to be just inside the walls of a church, right? I think if you're called to leadership in medicine or the arts or in commerce or wherever, that if you are leading and you love people uh, in your charge, you are going to be an effective leader almost guaranteed. You might not have every skill, you might, might be super gifted in every way, but you are going to be have an impact and people will want to, to follow, people will want to serve, um, they'll be inspired um, by your example. Uh, so a heart for those um, and, and then John riddles his letter, 1 John, another amazing letter, with references to God's love and our love for one another. There's dozens of references in 1 John alone to love being preeminent. So inner circle three, John, right? 
um, was transformed from probably a little hot headed and, and a little unruly and a little rowdy into someone who loved uh, really, really well. Um, uh, we'll finish with this, this quote, this is good. Um, the a little section is blocked off for me, so I'm gonna guess, but we'll see. Of course, like life itself, power is nothing. We're something, 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 okay? But love without power is less than it was meant to be. Love without the capacity to make something of the world, without the ability to respond to and make room for the beloved's flourishing is frustrated love. That is why the love that is the heartbeat of the Christian story, the father's love for the son and through the son for the world, is not simply a sentimental feeling or a distant ethereal theological truth, but has been signed and sealed by the most audacious act of true power in the history of the world, the resurrection of the son from the dead. Power at its best is resurrection to full life, to full humanity. Whenever human beings become what they were meant to be, when even death cannot finally hold its prisoners, then we can truly speak of power. So I, I love that, that, that what he's, I think he's saying is, is love is preeminent, yes, and that uh, power is also ours in Christ to bring life, to redeem uh, all creation. When you look, and we won't do it now, but when you look carefully at what Jesus tended, what was he, who is he paying attention to? Uh, he was tending to the needs of everyone, including the down and outs, including the, the least of these. Jesus was seeing them and that power was changing things, especially for the poor. Um, I, I think we should always think, I'll finish with this, when we think of being involved as, as ministers, right, of the gospel, <clears throat> it's not just evangelism. It's not just social justice and social action. It's both. I believe that what's modeled for us in the New Testament is a multi-pronged kind of ministry mindset. It's proclamation and it's real down and dirty physical uh, you know, and uh, ministry um, meeting real needs uh, in the world. Uh, let me get out of the screen. And Tyler, um, we're, it's late. I, I don't think we'll skip Q&A. Could you set up the the breakouts for us, please.